Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to worship. Where is everybody? <laughs> uh, I, I think you're all uh, online then right now. That's good. It's good to see you all. Well, God bless your worship tonight. We'll uh, be using the order of service, printed for you in the folder, and we'll begin on this celebration of the Passover. Uh, but we're Christians, so we call it Holy Thursday. But it was the last Passover that Jesus ate on this earth, uh, but the first, the first meal, uh, which we celebrate still today, as we call it Holy Communion. Um, we we'll talk about all that tonight. We'll begin our worship as we sing. Now the light has gone forth. God bless your worship. <laughs> Father, we have sinned against you with our thoughts and our words and our deeds and in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliverance is for us that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun. And we shall serve him in newness of life. Amen. Look.
our first lesson this Holy Thursday from Exodus chapter 24. God, Israel had pro uh, promised to obey God's law. They did not. So how were these lawbreakers able to commune with the Holy God? They were sprinkled with the blood of the covenant. Moses records these words. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, along with Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship me from a distance. Only Moses is allowed to come near the Lord, but the others are not to come near, and the people are not to go up with him. Moses came and reported to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. Then all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has spoken we will do. Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He got up early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain. He set up twelve memorial stones for the twelve tribes of Israel. He sent young Israelite men who offered whole burnt offerings <coughs> Excuse me. and sacrificed fellowship offerings of cattle to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in bowls and he splashed half of the blood on the altar. He took the Book of the Covenant and read it out loud to the people, and they said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, we will obey. Moses took the blood and splashed it on the people. He said, Look, here is the blood of the covenant which the Lord made with you by means of all these words. Then Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel went up, they saw the God of Israel under his feet. They saw what looked like a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky. The Lord did not lay his hand on the dignitaries of the people of Israel. They gazed at God, and they ate and drank. We'll continue as we sing our psalm, Psalm 116, I Walk in the Presence of the Lord. second reading we find in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians chapter 11 Paul maintains that every time we celebrate the sacrament we feast on the flesh and blood of God for the forgiveness of sins and a restored unity with our Father Paul writes for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the meal, he also took the cup, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the Lord's body and blood. Instead, let a person examine himself, and after doing so, let him eat of the bread and drink from the cup. <clears throat> let us rise for the gospel lesson. steps led him to the upper room, Mark chapter 14, our sermon text this evening. On that first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city, and there a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, tell the owner of the house that the teacher says, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. His disciples left yeah. and went into the city and found the things, found things just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he arrived with the, the twelve. This is our gospel lesson. Please be seated. <clears throat> we'll continue as we sing our next hymn, Jesus Christ, our blessed Savior. Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Your fellow believers, it was called the cynical. It's a Latin word, it means dining room. And this dining room has been important to Christian pilgrims for about 1,600 years. The claim is that this, this particular cynical was located on what is called Mount Zion. And that's, um, that's the designation for a certain portion of Jerusalem's western hill. It's not very big. In fact, when I first saw it myself when I was in Jerusalem, I thought, huh, oh, that's Mount Zion. We'd say it's a small hill. <clears throat> it is supposedly the same upper room where Jesus and his disciples celebrated the Last Supper, and it's also supposedly built upon the ancient location of King David's tomb. Well, King David's palace is on Mount Zion. Mount Zion, like I said, isn't very big, so it's not hard to imagine that that might be true. <coughs> on the lower floor of this building, You'll find the Jews regularly gathering and praying in what has now, in effect, really become a synagogue. The synagogue that pilgrims visit today, though, can hardly be the same room that Jesus and his disciples would have sat in in his day, where Jesus told his apostles to take and eat and to take and drink. The foundations for this building seem to go back to the third century, so some, some matter of years after Jesus' life, 300 years. But um, you visit that room today, and it's a massive room, and it's got these <coughs> grand Gothic arches and uh, pillars, ribbed vaults, nothing like the architecture of Jesus' time. Historians estimate it was probably built around the 12th, the, uh, AD 1200. But that doesn't seem to make any difference because pilgrims flock there year after year. Uh, in May 2014, that included Pope Francis, who ended up his uh, pilgrimage to Jerusalem that year uh, by celebrating a mass in that space. The Pope said in his homily here, the church was born and was born to go forth. The actual, the actual location of the upper room is probably lost to us um, in, in history. But the pull of the upper room, it is not lost on Christians, especially Christians here who are gathering tonight to remember that first, um, that first Thursday evening. We go on our own quiet pilgrimage of faith, guided by God's Holy Spirit, where Jesus' final steps led to the upper room, where his disciples carefully prepared for the Passover, and where our Savior carefully prepared for his death. <clears throat> when you and I visit the quiet upper room, we go there fully expecting to hear about the supper. To hear the Lamb's gracious command, take and eat, this is my body, take drink, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. We go to the upper room in spirit because we want to hear how Jesus gave his disciples this spiritual gift, the visible gospel, but also this very tangible gift. Um, think about it. This sacrament, how, how it comes to you in smell, in sound, in sight, in touch, in taste. And when we stand to receive it here at Zion, right uh, before the, the altar of God, it is uh, a way to see. I just wanted you to be sure that we weren't passing over that part uh, of what should also be. Sins as we uh, hear the readings that help us to understand what's happening as we receive the Lord's Supper, uh, the, as we re actually do receive the Lamb's body and blood at the rail, and in this way are restored to live a new and holy life because of what Jesus Christ did for us on His cross. 
And yet, even though tonight it's all about the supper, it is not a bad idea for us to realize that that supper didn't just fall out of the sky, uh, catered by some heavenly guests. Um, the Lord's Supper itself was carefully and purposefully written in the Old Testament celebration of Passover. I don't know if you have any Jewish friends or not, but Passover takes a long time to prepare for, for a Jewish family. <clears throat> and it certainly did on the part of the disciples. The Passover meal itself lasts several hours. It is elaborate, it is scripted, it is full of details, it is a, it's a thousands of year old ritual, and there are all sorts of different dishes that are carefully prepared uh, for the, the meal, even though they are the simplest affair. The, uh, the carpus, that's an appetizer of a small piece of parsley, onion, or boiled potato dipped in salt water. Matzah, it's just unleavened bread and, and uh, water. Um, or, I'm sorry, unleavened bread. It is unleavened bread made of nothing but flour and water. Two ingredients, flour and water. Uh, matzah, matzah balls. Kerasef, a paste-like a paste-like sauce made of fruits and nuts and wine. Maror, you know, just the bitter herbs. Often made with horseradish, but sometimes if they just can't keep that horseradish, which I love, uh, they'll use um, romaine lettuce. And then a roast today represents the offering brought to the temple. But every one of those courses is eaten slowly and deliberately, solemnly, solemnly. Uh, accompanied by a script passed down through the generations, a script that's meant to remind and to educate. Um, I brought this book. I bought this when I was in Israel one time, and uh, some of you know that I love I love these kinds of books. These uh, <coughs> pop ups. Who didn't like pop up books when they were kids? Uh, so this one has as a pop up where you can. This is uh, the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea and the chosen. It's the whole story of the, the um, Haggadah of Passover. It's in English, it's also in Hebrew, but it's, it's interesting. And, and the idea of it, of course, the Hebrew book, you start on the back and go forward. But uh, the idea of it is that you, it tells the story of. Um, what takes place, and you can learn how to do it. But I'll pass it around because there's not so many of you here. Be careful with it. Um, oh dear. So a lot is happening when you have Passover. A lot of tradition, a lot of education. The children are often asked to recite or read some of the parts of the uh, service. <laughs> and you shouldn't also forget too that um, during the course of the Passover, part of the prescription is there are four cups of wine uh, during the meal. And um, probably a good recommendation to water down the wine because four cups gets to be a lot. <clears throat> All of this is done in someone's best setting. I mean, you pull out the very best dishes and uh, silverware that you have, like a state, uh, a state dinner, with the, the best dishes, best accommodations to host this formal affair once a year. So a lot of meticulous care went into preparing the setting we know as the upper room by the disciples, by the way. It would have to be ceremonially, ceremonially, uh, is more than just a cursory sweeping. Thoroughly swept out the day before the entire house, every last crumb of yeast had to be cleansed from every nook and cranny of every corner of the house. So when Jesus was told by two of his disciples to go into the city and find an owner that would show them, listen carefully, a large upper room furnished and ready, they must have danced a jig. Furnished and ready meant all that prep work had already been done. All they had to do was secure the room. Was there any preparation left? 
Well, sure they did. It's not to get a land. And that was a chore. Uh, you couldn't just go to the local deli, the Jewish deli, and say, I'd like a pre roasted lamb, please. Uh, there was no such thing. You bought the lamb at the temple. The, the lamb was slaughtered at the temple. And first of all, it had to pass inspection uh, by the priest, so it had to meet certain requirements. The lamb um, was probably going to cost you a pretty penny at this point because it's kind of late in the game. There aren't so many lambs left. They get the lamb, they, um, they get it slaughtered, they get it roasted. So that's done, but that's a lot of work. It's time consuming, especially for people like us who get frustrated when the microwave needs an extra minute to heat up a slice of pizza. But <clears throat> there's an even bigger task that lay ahead of them. Now it's finding the room. The room was a big concern. Here's why. It, I told you on Sunday, if you were here, that there was a historian named Josephus that wrote that in the time of Christ, the city would swell to about 2 million people. Uh, Jerusalem is a pretty big city nowadays, but back in Jesus' time, there was a wall <clears throat> around the city. There were four quarters. The, um, I'm not going to say all the four quarters on this one, but the, it, we would say it was postage stamp size. It was not very big as far as what we would call a big city. Too many people, I don't know where they put them all, but <clears throat> there, was a, there was a rule There was a rule, I can't, I can't remember where I wrote it, but it's in the Mishnah, which is the, uh, the commentary that goes along with the, the scriptures for the Jews, the, the commentary on the Old Testament. And the rule said you weren't allowed to take a roasted lamb out of the city limits of Jerusalem. You had to eat it in the city limits. So you had to find an upper room to eat with your people, uh, or a room, period, a room to eat with your people within the city limits of Jerusalem, those rooms would have gone uh, for a premium and they wouldn't have, um, they wouldn't have been enough. I don't know where two million people would have gathered in that little space to eat in, a, in any kind of a room. Maybe someone's bedroom even. Um, I bet the people of Jerusalem uh, cleaned out lots of rooms so that they could sell them for a space for the Passover meal to anybody who was willing to pay. They probably did a very good business that week. <clears throat> Let's see. None of this was too hard for Jesus, though. Right? This was not too hard for Jesus, who later would recline at the table with the 12 apostles, for Jesus, who said, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Not so hard for the Lamb of God who, um, who knew that this piece of what was happening during Holy Week was vital in God's plan. And that's why he sent Peter and John into Jerusalem with fail-safe directions to talk to a man carrying a jar of water how in the world are they going to find a guy carrying a jar of water, a certain guy, right, in a city of two million? Well, the guy might as well have been wearing orange blades because, or, or, and maybe even have a target on his back uh, to add a, a little distinction. Men didn't carry the water. Uh, that was women's work. So this was a, a pretty easy uh, sighting, I would think. And as they're walking in, they certainly did find him. They followed him. See where he goes. Wherever he enters, tell the owner of the house that the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. They needed a large one because he had 13, right? Uh, furnished and ready, make preparations for us there. And you wonder, was the owner of the house uh, a devotee, right? Did he know of Jesus. It seemed like maybe he did because uh, he, he addresses uh, Jesus as the teacher. Uh, 
of asks, and the guy understands. So uh, you think he must have been a believer. It was enough to lock in the room. It was no accident that these final steps led to the upper room. Now, all the preparations that, that uh, had to be made would have failed if Jesus hadn't had his divine hand in things. And failure wasn't really an option, was it? Uh, there was an eternity of careful planning behind Jesus as he went into that room in order to lock it in. It's almost as if a death shroud covered the evening's activities. Jesus reclined at the table with his disciples and oddly, he kept departing from the script, the script in that book. Right? He kept leaving uh, saying things that weren't part of the script. Like, Amen, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me, which was a bombshell. And, and no less shocking were Jesus' references to the fact that he himself was going to be slaughtered, the Lamb of God. In the supper, during the supper, he says, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is poured out for many, Amen, I tell you, I will Certainly not drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. He goes on to say that this night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And then directly to Peter, a little bit later, I tell you today, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Shocking stuff. And on top of all this, there are the things that are recorded in John's Gospel. You know John's Gospel is different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There are a lot, there's a lot in John that's not in the other three Gospels. In John's Gospel, we have things like chapter 14, verse 2. <clears throat> in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. Uh, Fourteen six. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in verse 27 of that same chapter, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let it be afraid. The Savior gave all those words, and a lot more, because his final steps led to that upper room. He knew that he needed a private place to prepare for his own death, a safe place, a place hidden away from the crowds, a, a sheltered place unknown to his enemies, where he could enjoy a few final hours of fellowship with his 12 before he went to his cross. Now, when we carefully piece together all of the gospel accounts about the message that Jesus passed along to the owner of the upper room, we learned that there was something that Mark, which is our text tonight, didn't report on them. Matthew did. Matthew had one little detail. My time is near. I will observe the Passover with my disciples at your house. My time is near. So the appointed time is at hand. The time that the Lord had set from eternity is now. This is the time set for all of Jesus' final steps. To the upper room, to the garden, to Judas, who betrayed him with a kiss, to the mock trials, to the scourgings and the spitting, and, and the crown of thorns and the stone pavement, uh, to the trial before Pontius Pilate, to the Via Dolorosa, the, way, the road of sorrows, and to that center cross on Golgotha where God's Lamb would forever finish the messy business of washing away the, the stench of humanity's sins, our sins, my sin, and yours. And this is where this Holy Thursday needs to get a lot more personal. The, the same Jesus who could look over a city of two million people and look down into the streets and see that man with the water bucket. 
of the matter by the water to assist her. And see the man who would allow he and his disciples to spend time that evening in his upper room. He was also able to look down the corridors of time and see me in the parsonage this past week, hunkered down, working on, well, on a long weekend, often alone. See you at your jobs or at your homes, doing the things that you do, or at school if it applies to you. We have no school age people here. Um, <coughs> <clears throat> he sees us. And your, your Savior can see that your life is not an endless stream of hallelujah and praise <clears throat> the Lord. That it instead has moments of weeping and worry and fear and maybe questioning and some flashes of anger. Maybe a wonderment about what in the world the Lord has in store for you, and is it stuff that I can actually do? <coughs> and the reason that we can see all of that stuff is because there is a squatter, a trespasser by your side, at your, at your place, in your home, at your job, in school with you, at the parsonage. It doesn't do any good to call somebody like the police to come and get that person out of your house because it is your old sinful nature it is ever with you and with me and that explains why sometimes and especially it seems when life is hard for some reason or another we can get on each other's nerves we can get uh, testy with each other we can get on um, crabby A little worried and yeah maybe fearful too about things and Jesus knew all about that stuff he paid for all of that stuff nothing takes our Lord by surprise nothing no one not even death not even the gates of hell can undermine the plans that he has made for you and for me. And so his final steps did, in fact, lead to that upper room, but that too. He had planned it just that way. Mark matter-of-factly reports this. His disciples left and went into the city and found things just as he had told them, he being Jesus, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, Jesus arrived in Luke 12. And the next day, his final steps led to the place of the skull. And that, too, was just as he planned. Amen. Let us rise. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> we'll continue as we sing together the Song of Mary that's in your service book. Mm -hmm.
ask our ushers to come forward as we gather our gifts for the Lord's work. God pictured in the ancient Passover feast, now giving your own body, <coughs> pouring out your own blood in holy communion. The says the Passover lambs assured the Israelites of God's promise to deliver them from death. Strengthen our belief that the bread is healed from your body, and the wine is healed from your blood, given to us for our forgiveness, life, and salvation. Prepare us to receive this sacrament. Remembering your death and repenting of our sins. Unite us by our oneness of faith throughout this congregation and our sin, and love us to the end, that we may love others as we have loved us. We rejoice in our fellow believers who have been instructed in the Lord's Word and confirmed in the Lutheran faith who are now ready to receive Holy Communion. We fill the time with every spiritual blessing for the of your will. We pray for those absent from this sacrament because of their own neglect. Call them in your mercy to return and renew their faith. Keep in your care those unable to receive the sacraments often because they are homebound, hospitalized, imprisoned, serving in the military or otherwise separated from the fellowship of believers. Encourage them so that they do not lose hope. Be gracious to us all. And nourish us to this feast, that we remain faithful unto death, and become partakers of the wedding feast of the Lamb. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places. Give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. <laughs> God, for your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him, you made all things. In him, you are well pleased. 
He is the incarnate word that's conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ, through him we glorify and honor you, God our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you all. In blood of our Lord, our Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen you and preserve you in the one true faith until the end of our last. You who are truly forgiven of your sins. Depart now, live in peace with your Lord.
Let us rise. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this drink of bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Praise be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Lord, remain standing as we're able as we sing our closing hymn, Not All the Blood of Jesus. Again, I'm glad you could be here tonight with us. Tomorrow night, our Good Friday service, it's going to be a tenebrae service as well as uh, highlighting the seven words spoken from the cross. And we'll do our um, service of confession and absolution uh, at the very end of our service as well. So I uh, hope you can be there, spread the word about that, and invite your friends on Facebook. I think it's a special service uh, that people do not often do. Um, get to witness a service like that and uh, a good opportunity, I think, for, for people, especially if they don't know what this is all about. Um, stick around if you can tonight. We're going to take down a few things. Uh, there's people that do that, but maybe we can use their help. Um, God bless your continued salvation for you.